nothing I see in this room on this street from this window in this place means anything means anything nothing I see in this room on this street from Thank you all so much for joining me and embarking on the study of A Course in Miracles. We're going to go through it this year from cover to cover, the Foundation for Inner Peace version. If you don't have one, you can find it on acim.org. Let's, uh, and I'm uh, Miracle Willie, forgiveness teacher from the Ozarks, and I'm so glad that you've come to join me in studying this book today. We're ready for... Uh, we're going to do lesson one in uh, the workbook for students, which is what I just sing. Nothing I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place, means anything. But before we read the lesson, let's look at the uh, introduction, the page before. A theoretical foundation such as the text provides is necessary as a framework to make the exercises in this workbook meaningful. Yet it is doing the exercises that will make the goal of the course possible. An untrained mind can accomplish nothing. It is the purpose of this workbook to train your mind, to think along the lines the text sets forth. The exercises are very simple. They do not require a great deal of time, and it does not matter where you do them. They need no preparation. The training period is one year. The exercises are numbered from 1 to 365. Do not undertake to do more than one set of exercises a day. The workbook is divided into two main sections. The first, dealing with the undoing of the way you see now, and the second, with the acquisition of true perception. With the exception of the review periods, each day's exercises are planned around one central idea, which is stated first. This is followed by a description of the specific procedures by which the idea for the day is to be applied. The purpose of the workbook is to train your mind in a systematic way to a different perception of everyone and everything in the world. The exercises are planned to help you generalize the lessons so that you will understand that each of them is equally applicable to everyone and everything you see. Transfer of training and true perception does not proceed as does transfer of the training of the world. If true perception has been achieved in connection with any person, situation, or event, total transfer to everyone and everything is certain. On the other hand, one exception held apart from true perception makes its accomplishment anywhere impossible. The only general rules to be observed throughout then are first, that the exercises be practiced with great specificity as will be indicated. This will help you to generalize the ideas involved to every situation in which you find yourself, and to everyone and everything in it. Second, be sure that you do not decide for yourself that there are some people, situations, or things to which the ideas are inapplicable. This will interfere with transfer of training. The very nature of true perception 
is that it has no limits. It is the opposite of the way you see now. The overall aim of the exercises is to increase your ability to extend the ideas you will be practicing to include everything. This will require no effort on your part. The exercises themselves meet the conditions necessary for this kind of transfer. Some of the ideas the workbook presents you will find hard to believe and others may seem to be quite startling. This does not matter. You're merely asked to apply the ideas as you are directed to do. You're not asked to judge them at all. You're asked only to use them. It is their use that will give them meaning to you and will show you that they are true. Remember only this. You need not believe the ideas, you need not accept them, and you need not even welcome them. <laughs> Some of them you may actively resist. None of this will matter or decrease their efficacy. But do not allow yourself to make exceptions in applying the idea the workbook contains. And whatever your reactions to the ideas may be, use them. Nothing more than that is required. And then lesson one, nothing I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place, means anything. Now look slowly around you and practice applying this idea very specifically to whatever you see. This table does not mean anything. This chair does not mean anything. This hand does not mean anything. This foot does not mean anything. This pen does not mean anything. Then look farther away from your immediate area and apply the idea to a wider range. That door does not mean anything. That body does not mean anything. That lamp does not mean anything. That sign does not mean anything. That shadow does not mean anything. Notice that these statements are not arranged in any order and make no allowance for differences in the kinds of things to which they are applied. That is the purpose of the exercise. The statement should merely be applied to anything you see. As you practice the idea for the day, use it totally indiscriminately. Do not attempt to apply it to everything you see, for these exercises should not become ritualistic. Only be sure that nothing you see is specifically excluded. One thing is like another as far as the application of the idea is concerned. Each of the first three lessons should not be done more than twice a day each, preferably morning and evening, nor should they be attempted for more than a minute or so, unless that entails a sense of hurry. A comfortable sense of leisure is essential. A comfortable sense of leisure is essential. So don't be in a hurry doing these lessons. Uh, and I, for, for your you, new, new students, he's saying just one, twice a day, um, just for a minute or so. And, uh, and then on uh, you, you uh, second and more time students that have been through the course already, I would encourage you to do exactly as specified for just, you know, the two short periods of that day. But then if you've already developed a, 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 a habit of spending some time, maybe 15 minutes, uh, in the silence twice a day, I would encourage you to do that after you do the lesson. But, you know, still sitting down. You don't have to get up and then just, you know, do the lesson and then go into your meditation for the day. That's for your, your second and third and more year students. But your first year students, just one minute in the morning and one minute in the evening, it'll be, be plenty good. Okay, let's see. Uh, so, so, and you'll just say to yourself, nothing I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place means anything, and then just say what you see. That tree does not mean anything. That branch does not mean anything. That blade of grass does not mean anything. That uh, cedar tree does not mean anything. Whatever you see and just do it non un in indiscriminately. Okay, now let's go, let's go look at, uh, in a preface at the beginning of our text, and we're gonna read what Helen has to say. The first two sections she wrote 
not inspired necessarily by the voice that directed the rest of the book. So we get we get a little bit about how how she came to know how she came to pen the book. While you're turning there to the preface in the text, uh, what holy days and holidays are going on around the world? Well, yesterday I told you it was Hogmania. Well, it's actually Hogmanae, which is a Scots and Viking celebration bringing in the new year. Uh, it's the 12th day of Christmas. It's the seventh day of Kwanzaa. Uh, of course, it's New Year's. Happy New Year. Uh, Solemnity of Mary, Mother of God, a Roman Catholic holiday. Osho Gatsu, which is a Shinto holiday uh, since 1873, which is the Japanese New Year since they were westernized. Apple Gifting Day, Bonza Bottler Day, one of one. Uh, commitment Day, Divorce Monday. <laughs> commitment Day and Divorce Monday. They don't seem like they ought to go together, huh? Copyright Law Day, Ellis Island Day, Euro Day, First Foot Day, Global Family Day, Hansel Day, Mummer's Parade, National Bloody Mary Day, National I Hangover Day, <coughs> New Year's Day, New Year's Dishonor List Day, Polar Bear Plunge or Swim Day, I take a swim on a, on a cold January day, Public Domain Day, Rose Bowl Game Day, St. Basil's Day, Thank God It's Monday Day, Tournament of Roses Parade. Now, I just said the Rose Bowl game, but also the Tournament of Roses Parade. World Day of Peace. That should be something that we should hold very dear, is to be at peace in ourselves and to spread that peace to the whole world. That's what we'll be learning how to do in A Course in Miracles this year. Z Day, and I found all those on both Drexel University uh, website and holidaysandobservances.com. And I want to... Uh, tell you about an edible landscaping plant, the Asamina triloba, which is the Shenandoah pawpaw. It's one of the Peterson pawpaws. And the Shenandoah pawpaw, a real taste treat. It's, it's trademarked. A smooth custard texture, just the right balance of fragrant, sweet, fruity flavor and agreeable aftertaste. Large fruit, few seeds, 6% by weight. Firmer texture than wild pawpaws, but softer than the other varieties. So, you know, just something to kind of get our mind on, on something a little bit more down to earth for just a little bit. Because this, this book can be somewhat, uh, um, take some attention to really understand it. So we don't want to overload ourselves. So we'll learn a few things about, about the plant world as we go along. Okay, now let's look at the preface. This preface was written in 1977 in response to many requests for a brief introduction to A Course in Miracles. The first two parts, how it came and what it is, Helen Shuckman wrote herself. The final part, what it says, was written by the process of interdictation described in the preface, how it came. A Course in Miracles began with the sudden decision of two people to join in a common goal. Their names were Helen Shuckman and William Thedford, professors of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York City. It does not matter who they were, except that the story shows that with God all things are possible. <laughs> they were anything but spiritual. Their relationship with each other was difficult and often strained and they were concerned with personal and professional accept acceptance and status. In general, they had considerable investment in the values of the world. Their lives were hardly in accord with anything the Course advocates. Helen, the one who received the material, describes herself. Psychologist, educator, conservative in theory, and atheistic in belief. I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting, and then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could never have predicted. The head of my department unexpectedly announced that he was tired of the angry and aggressive feeling our attitudes reflected and concluded that there must be another way. <laughs> As if on cue, I agreed to help him find it. Apparently, this course is the other way. 
Although their intentions were serious, although their intention was serious, they had great difficulty in starting out on their joint venture. But they had given the Holy Spirit the little willingness, the little willingness, that as the course itself was to emphasize again and again, is sufficient to enable him to use any situation for his purposes and to provide it with his power. To continue Helen's first person account, three startling months preceded the actual writing, during which time Bill suggested that I write down the highly symbolic dreams and descriptions of the strange images that were coming to me. And I might just mention the first dream that she had was she was in a cave and written on the cave wall, it just said, God is. And coming from an atheist, you know, that was quite a, a, a jolting uh, picture. That was her first introduction to this voice, God is. Although I had grown more accustomed to the unexpected by that time, I was still very surprised when I wrote, this is a course in miracles. That was my introduction to the voice. It made no sound, but seemed to be giving me a kind of rapid inner dictation which I took down in a shorthand notebook. The writing was never automatic. It could be interrupted at any time and later picked up again. It made me very uncomfortable, but it never seriously occurred to me to stop. It seemed to be a special assignment I had somehow, somewhere agreed to complete. It represented a truly collaborative venture between Bill and myself, and much of its significance, I am sure, lies in that. I would take down what the voice said and read it to him the next day, and he typed it from my dictation. I expect he had his special assignment, too. Without his encouragement and support, I would never have been able to fulfill mine. The whole process took about seven years. The text came first, and then the workbook for students, and finally the manual for teachers. Only a few minor changes have been made. Chapter titles and subheadings have been inserted in the text, and some of the more personal references that occurred at the beginning have been omitted. Otherwise, the material is substantially unchanged. The name of the, collabor the collaborators in the recording of the course do not appear on the cover because the course can and should stand on its own. It is not intended to become the basis for another cult. Its only purpose is to provide a way in which some people will be able to find their own internal teacher. And I'm gonna get my head right up there in the camera for a minute if I can. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to see how much time we have. Let's go ahead and read the next section, what it is. As it's as its title implies, the course is arranged throughout as a teaching device. It consists of three books, a 669-page text, a 488-page workbook for students, and a 92-page manual for teachers. The order in which students choose to use the books and the ways in which they study them depend on their particular needs and preferences. The curriculum the course proposes is carefully conceived and is explained step by step at both the theoretical and the practical levels. It emphasizes application rather than theory and experience rather than theology. Experience rather than theology. It specifically states that a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience is not only possible, but necessary. Although Christian, and that's how the man you Manual uh, for Teachers, page 77. Although Christian in statement, the course deals with universal spiritual themes. It emphasizes that it is but one version of the universal curriculum. There are many others, this one differing from them only in form. They all lead to God in the end. That's why it's called A Course in Miracles instead of The Course in Miracles. The text is largely theoretical and sets forth the concepts on which the course's thought system is based. Its ideas contain the foundation for the workbook's lessons. Without the practical application the workbook provides, the text would remain largely a series of abstractions which would hardly suffice to bring about the thought reversal at which the course aims. The workbook includes 365 lessons, one for each day of the year. 
It is not necessar necessary, however, to do the lessons at that tempo, and one might want to remain with a particular, particularly appealing lesson for more than one day. The instructions urge only that not more than one lesson a day should be attempted. The practical nature of the workbook is underscored by the introduction to its lessons, which emphasizes experience through application rather than a prior commitment to a spiritual goal. And on page two of the workbook, it says, some of the ideas the workbook presents you will find, you will find hard to believe, and others may seem to be quite startling. This does not matter. You're merely asked to apply the idea as you are directed to do. You're not asked to judge them at all. You're asked only to use them. It is their use that will give them meaning to you and will show you that they are true. Remember only this. You need not believe the ideas. You need not accept them. And you need not even welcome them. Some of them you may actively resist. None of this will matter or decrease their efficacy. But do not allow yourself to make exceptions in applying the idea the workbook contains. And whatever your reaction to the ideas may be, use them. Nothing more than that is required. Finally, the Manual for Teachers, which is written in question and answer form, provides answers to some of the more likely questions a student might ask. It also includes a clarification of a number of the terms the course uses explaining them within the theoretical framework of the text. The course makes no claim to finality, nor are the workbook lessons intended to bring the student's learning to completion. At the end, the reader is left in the hands of his own or her own internal teacher, who will direct all subsequent learning as he sees fit. While the course is comprehensive in scope, truth cannot be limited to any finite form, as is clearly recognized in the statement at the end of the workbook. And this is on, at the end of the workbook, page 487, it says this, and this, this will finish this section. This course is a beginning, not an end. No more specific lessons are assigned, for there is no more need of them. Henceforth hear but the voice for God. He will direct your efforts, telling you exactly what to do, how to direct your mind, and when to come to Him in silence, asking for His sure direction and His certain word. Okay, so, so this is what we'll be learning this year, is how to hear the voice of God within us. All right, well, and I mean, let me encourage you, let's just review this. Nothing I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place means anything. Look slowly about you and practice applying this idea very specifically to whatever you see. And then as your eye looks at it, just uh, tell yourself um, this blank does not mean anything. And, and just, just whatever you see. Then look further away from your immediate area and apply the idea to a wider range and do the same thing. Notice that these statements are not arranged in any order and make no allowance for differences in the kinds of things to which they are applied. That is the purpose of the exercise. The statement should merely be applied to anything you see. As you practice the idea for the day, use it totally indiscriminately. Do not attempt to apply it to everything you see, for these exercises should not become ritualistic. Only be sure that nothing you see is specifically excluded. One thing is like another as far as the application of the idea is concerned. Each of the first three lessons should not be done more than twice a day each, preferably morning and evening, no, nor should they be attempted for more than a minute or so, unless that entails a sense of hurry. A comfortable sense of leisure is essential. Okay. And I'm going to get my head right up there in the camera again so I can see. And I still can't quite see what that, what our time is. I think we're looking okay on time. I don't ever, I like to keep these down to about 25 minutes. So. Thank you all so much for embarking on this journey with me. Nothing I see in this room on 
on this street from this window in this place means anything means anything nothing I see in this woods under this tree on this ground in this place means anything means anything so thank you all so much for joining me and as they say in uh, in uh, Hebrew Shalom for peace Nothing I see in this place means anything. Shalom.